Hello and welcome to the WIDS Second Place um, 2021 Datathon Winners Call. Um, this is Maggie from Kaggle, and uh, we're excited to um, host this call. And I'll turn it over to Karen from the WIDS team to introduce her team. Hi, I'm Karen Mathis, and I am one of the co founders and co directors of the Women in Data Science. And on behalf of all of us, just wanted to congratulate you and your team, Masood. It was so wonderful um, uh, to have you involved. And we're excited to hear about your approaches and your insights to the data. And I'd also like to hand it over to the two co-leads of the WIDS Datathon this year who were really um, working amazingly hard to prepare and get everything ready for this Datathon uh, to ensure it was successful. And I'll let Meredith and Sharda, you can introduce yourself now. Hi there, Meredith Lee. I'm one of the WIDS Datathon co-chairs and chief technical advisor for UC Berkeley Computing, Data Science, and Society. Nice to meet you. And this is our fourth Datathon that I've been a part of. And it's just so great to see an institution like EPFL and understand the whole deadline thing. Thank you to the rest of your team and for representing. Sharda? Yeah. Hi, I'm Sarja Kalanidi. I'm also co-chair of the WIDS Datathon, and um, I'm a data scientist. I work in the medical field. It's been absolutely amazing for me to see uh, the, the level of participation um, and the, the extent of you know, the work and that has gone into preparing these models. Uh, congratulations, and I'm really looking forward to hearing your um, presentation. Thank you. So let me start with uh, introducing uh, our team. So my name is Masoud Farivar. Um, our team at EPFL uh, uh, is, uh, so it's me, uh, Master Sharon, Professor Sharon at EPFL, and the students, Hossein uh, Obedian Kong Ding. Uh, now, with the agenda, uh, uh, so I'm going to first introduce our team members, a little bit of their background and uh, how Kaggle has affected their careers. Uh, and. Uh, and then talk about our model, feature selection engineering, uh, and uh, training methods and some findings. And um, so, uh, so as I mentioned, uh, I'm a, my name is Masoud Faivar. I'm a, currently I'm a senior data scientist at SDSC and a scientist at EPFL. Uh, SDSC is the Swiss Data Science Center, uh, uh, which is a, uh, Federal agency uh, has uh, offices both at EPFL and ETH. Um, before moving to Switzerland, uh, I worked at Google Mountain View uh, from 2017 to late 2019. And before that, I, I completed my master's PhD postdoc uh, from 2010 to 2016 at Caltech. Um, so Kaggle, for me, uh, at, towards the end of my PhD, I discovered Kaggle. It's, uh, it was a career changing. Uh, uh, and uh, so I competed at Kaggle. I learned a lot and I advocated uh, Kaggle to um, my fellow uh, friends and colleagues. Uh, Masa Sharon, uh, uh, Masa Sharon is uh, currently, she's an assistant professor at EPFL. Uh, both at electrical engineering department and center for neuroprosthetics at Geneva Camp Bio Campus. Um, her research interests lies at the intersection of uh, machine learning and neural interfaces. Uh, and formerly she was at Cornell. Before that, she was a postdoc at Caltech. That's at the time uh, we were both postdoc at Caltech. And uh, uh, she's also Kaggle. Uh, She's the recipient of 2019 Google Faculty Research and Machine Learning, um, and she um, uh, she's also a fan of Kaggle and hosted in-class competitions. Uh, so on, on the student side, uh, Hussein Abedi uh, was a senior data scientist at Proy Company. So she, she he he'll be moving. Uh, he will be joining PFL uh, after the re reopening of the school. Uh, he was supposed to join this year. Now, before that, he has a, holds a master's degree from American University in 2016. He's also a Kaggle uh, uh, expert uh, uh, with two gold medals. Uh, and uh, Kongbi, she's a PhD student at EPFL, uh, campus part in Geneva. Uh, prior to joining EPFL this year, she was um, 
she has a master's degree from Tsinghua University, Beijing. And she, he, she has also uh, started Kaga uh, competitions. Um, uh, I just want to mention that uh, our team last year, we also participated, uh, three of our uh, members, uh, along with uh, another colleague at the PFL, who participated in last year's uh, uh, WITS competition, and we ranked fifth. So a lot of the uh, uh, findings in that competition was also uh, helped us with uh, this competition as uh, the data sets are pretty similar. Um, so with, with that, I'll start with the model. So as you know, grading boosting based methods uh, have been a top performance in competition. This was also uh, no surprise given the uh, nice structured tabular uh, format of the data. Like GBM particularly, this framework was used because of the faster speeds uh, as we did not have uh, massive amount of computing resources. We opted for the speed. Uh, uh, on the data preparation side, um, one of the ideas we used was to consider remove categorical features that uh, does not appear both in train and test. With that, I mean, if you consider the set of unique uh, values of it, each categorical feature in both train and test, if we have a feature that uh, has has a value, a particular value, one of them that, and that value does not appear in test, uh, that's of no use, we just uh, remove those variables. And then label encoding was used, uh, uh, and then uh, specification of the categorical features, by that we, we made use uh, one hot encoding, that, who set the performance on the validation side as we're dealing with an imbalanced data set. Uh, five, fivefold certified cross validation was used. Um, and then at the end, of, we, we so used the three bagging, three time bagging uh, of our boosting based metal, method and uh, uh, using the best features that have been uh, discovered. Uh, yeah, so pretty standard tools Python. Uh, scikit-learn, LGBM, uh, and uh, all other good stuff. Uh, running time, each run of the model when dealing with uh, feature engineering, uh, it's about uh, two hours uh, of time, our, our, our average computing speed that we ever had. So on the feature selection and engineering, I um, wanted to point out a few things. We, we highlights from here is that we did look at the uh, interactions of the uh, certain subset of categorical features and most of these ca interesting categorical features were based on the findings of last year's competition. Uh, with that, uh, basically the intuition is that uh, we're trying to feed the model with a unique set of a combination of categorical features that raise the chance of uh, a patient I think a high chance of being diabetic. Uh, and uh, count features and uh, most of the other uh, uh, ideas are uh, typical. Uh, another thing I want to point out here is that uh, uh, the Apache 2J diagnosis feature was, uh, I think last year was one of the uh, most important feature for us. and. Uh, as well here, we did uh, explore this feature and the combinations of the, uh, we can, we, we found with this one, uh, and we explored this particular feature extensively. And then, um, and then we uh, looked at, uh, on the model of feature selection, we didn't do particular, uh, we threw all the features that were one by one found interesting and then threw all of them at once. We didn't do any particular, which section at the end, instead we opted for a sample selection, uh, which basically trying to see which, uh, which sample uh, we can remove in order to uh, make it uh, the training data set uh, have a more similar distribution to the test data set. Uh, 
Now, as for the feature importance, uh, as you can see, the top top uh, feature is the top features are mostly related to uh, glucose levels. Uh, the first one is actually synthetic features uh, based. Uh, based on the sh sh code that has been shared. And then we have uh, obviously uh, uh, features related to obesity, age, and uh, uh, glucose. So uh, uh. now one thing I want to point out with this, uh, uh, one thing I want to point out here is that uh, I did see some of the uh, participant had eliminated the ICU unit feature, uh, basically assuming that this feature uh, is related, is not directly related to the uh, patient uh, and, and hence this may not have information related to uh, the chances of a patient being diabetic. However, uh, uh, if you look at the average of uh, the labels uh, in each uh, hospital ID category, uh, we can clearly see that the, the, there's a uh, interesting variance. And, and on top of that, uh, we can see that uh, the same ICU IDs appear both in uh, train and test data sets and uh, with a uh, very similar uh, distribution. So basically what this says is that we can sort of imply uh, the location, geolocation of the um, patient based on their ICU IDs and the features we built based on this particular feature. Uh, and what this does is that uh, basically, uh, if you look at the uh, the uh, ethnicity and the location of the uh, patients, this is a really uh, important feature that relates to um, the percentage of uh, people in particular location that, that are diabetic. Uh, so this was one of the features we did explore extensively, although I understand that the organizers had removed the hospital IDs in order to avoid this, but this could, uh, I'm not sure if it should call this a small data leakage, but uh, it's, uh, it's a, it contains useful information about the location of the uh, person as a, one of the top performing features. On the selection side, uh, so again, uh, as a summary, geolocation, uh, features related to glucose level and obesity factors. Um, these are uh, the important features for this problem, uh, perhaps not surprisingly. Uh, and uh, on the training side, basically, uh, each of uh, certain uh, light GBM models were trained uh, based on, uh, particularly we use the dark booster, which is one of the uh, specifications of uh, that uh, for running each uh, LGBM trainer. And, um, and then what we did was that we removed samples in, in our training, we removed the uh, training samples that did not look uh, very much similar to the test set uh, samples. Uh, uh, and this way we avoided uh, that type of noise. And then at the end, we had a weighted average of the models based on uh, leaderboard scores. And so this is one typical parameter that was passed to the um, uh, LGB, uh, the, the uh, light GBM uh, library. Um, so a uh, little bit of uh, discussion of findings and um, uh, one comment on the data set. Uh, basically, we uh, find that uh, removing around 12% of job, 12% of training samples uh, using the uh, adversarial validation method uh, is very helpful in this problem. 
so not using the the entire training set for uh, for, for uh, the, this uh, for using an, an energy beam. And basically, what adversarial validation is uh, in an ideal in an ideal uh, scenario. Uh, we should not have, be able to build a classifier that uh, this, uh, distinguishes between training and uh, a sample being from the training set or the test set. How, however, uh, once we build this set, basically trying to label each training uh, sample with zero as being in the training set and one for the uh, test samples, then if you build a, uh, model to predict whether the sample is from the trainer test, uh, then you could uh, try to see which samples are actually uh, labeled as train, uh, training uh, samples with a high confidence and then remove those because those will, uh, will, will decrease the performance of the model, those are noise. So, and the, on the specification of the category of features, again, I mentioned, uh, so if you have, uh, and these unique uh, values for a category, we want how to encode them, and uh, we use binary um, features here. So, uh, and then to discuss the uh, IC ID, and then one small trick we used uh, was that one once using the once running each LGBM run, uh, we did not uh, opt for the uh, traditional uh, uh, CV5. Uh, uh, Training, which is basically keeps twenty percent of the data, and the, the uh, trains on eighty percent. We train on the whole thing, and uh, then the challenge is uh, how to find the number of the training uh, rounds, and that's uh, so we, uh, we did find uh, fix this uh, number of uh, boosted trees or the training rounds uh, prior based on a different method, and then also particularly dot it was uh, what best for us in this problem. One small comment I have yet for the organization is that uh, in the data set, uh, we have, uh, we see features are uh, visualized. So basically the age uh, and the weight and BMI has been capped between two particular values uh, on the lower side and the higher uh, value side and then this sort of distorts the real value. Uh, so I have maybe, maybe, maybe uh, reduces the performance of the model, but I understand why on the eight side we may be removing the miners or uh, seniors on the uh, post 98, but that's, that was one of the observations we had for, uh, from last year's data and this, this year's uh, data as well. Um, so, Bit of a question uh, for us, uh, but as a summary from the simple one, if we, uh, for once a simple model was uh, we could achieve uh, uh, 0 0.70, 0.87 uh, uh, percent uh, um, AUC on the public leaderboard and private leaderboard uh, slightly higher. Um, a GPM with Dart booster. Uh, used adversarial validation back three times for, for each model. And then at the end, uh, uh, LGBM was run based on a uh, fixed number of uh, iterations. Um, so um, there's some references for us, uh, but uh, I'm done with my slides, but I, I have included some backup slides from uh, uh, some highlights from the code if there are questions. And also some slides from our last year's competition. Uh, I remember last year when the competition was on, the pandemic had just started. And uh, once the competition was finalized in February, uh, we had the all shutdowns and the, uh, pick up the pandemic and then uh so i have some slides if you're interested uh, uh, you can look at uh, afterwards uh but basically the problem was 
based on the given data set we have, can we predict IC mortality and can we uh, answer a problem that if hospitals get overwhelmed, or who needs to get priority? And uh, basically, that was a, a hot topic back then. Uh, I'm, I'm glad uh, we didn't uh, think we didn't get that bad. But uh, the slides I included uh, some some interesting observations from the data set. Uh, with that. Uh, um, I conclude my talk and uh, look forward to answer your questions. Uh, so we, we uh, did not particularly look at the uh, leaderboard score, but uh, the local, more importantly, and local uh, CV scores. We tried to uh, uh, boost our score, and for each set of so we had uh, we added uh, features and ideas one by one. So it's important to understand that, let's say, you want to add, uh, so uh, maybe one feature, one set of features we added was looking into the uh, mean to max. Uh, so we had a lot of parameters that had maximum glucose, minimum glucose, or maximum this and minimum that. So we, we said, what if we look at the difference of these two variables and added mm -hmm. to that as a feature? What if you look at it? Uh, 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 the ratio between these mean and maxes. So we uh, sort of started to throw these features and ideas one by one, and then um, and try to look at the local CV scores and say, okay, does this improve or not? Mm -hmm. uh, and this has been done manually, but uh, uh, I think uh, the more systematic way and more brute force way of doing it is AutoML. I, I, I assume that the Winners uh, from the H2O.AI, uh, that, that, that's where they have uh, the sort of the edge uh, where you can uh, systematically uh, have uh, AutoML explore all your feature set and uh, find your features one by one. But, but for us, it's more like a handcrafting features one by one. Uh, it's, uh, and it, once you do that, you spend time on the, with the data, if you also uh, with the set of, uh, sort of understand more understanding and knowledge of the particular features as well. Uh, so yeah. I think this, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. That's a, that's a great explanation. Meredith, Karen. Yeah, um, thank you so much for walking us through that. It was really interesting that you all, um, I do remember you from last year's leaderboard as well. So congratulations on, on moving up and the persistence. Do you feel that, um, any of the sort of insights in exploring the data set while I was looking at mortality last year sort of were critical for approaching the diabetes diagnosis data this year? Or do you have any, you know, this was something that we were thinking about in terms of on ramps, and we didn't want to make it a prerequisite that people had spent a year looking at the data previously, but, you know, clearly you had mentioned uh, you know, benefit and sort of incubating the data dictionary at the very least. Yes, uh, so I think uh, the although the problems look very uh, different, but however, uh, uh, it's uh, I think in a way they're very related in the sense that uh, uh, for instance, exploring that uh, apogee system variable. So the, uh, so one might think that. Oh, diabetes and mortality. Uh, predicting these two will be very different. Uh, but uh, uh, no, more or less, uh, the set of features that appeared on top of uh, for this one particular, of course, glucose uh, features jump up the uh, feature importance ladder. However, uh, the uh, exploring what does the apogee diagnosis uh, do here? How, how to deal with age here? So, for instance, for the age, we categorized age. We didn't just say, is this a number? We said we're going to build uh, our model is going to look at 60 year olds and then 40 year olds very differently. So these are so these are intuitions built on uh, the uh, top of the uh, competition last year's competition, or uh, maybe ideas uh, about uh, the uh, how does the, this hospital IDs and uh, ICU IDs uh, help here? So. Hospital ID and ICU IDs, we, we already know it's important. However, there was, uh, hospital ID was removed, but then we dig through uh, sort of ICU uh, IDs and uh, sort of extract information about the location of the patients. And I think that's important uh, and it sort of help our models try, um, benefit from the fact that uh, certain 
patients in uh, across the globe have uh, higher or less chance of having diabetes based on their maybe diet habits, etc. for that particular location. Excellent job. Uh, thank you for explaining that all. I don't have any further questions. Just want to add my congratulations again thank you. to you and the rest of the team. Please let them know. Uh, we, we so appreciated having them all involved. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And I, I think I, I also uh, am very uh, grateful for this particular contribution. Uh, it helped uh, and Kaggle uh, in general. So, so Kaggle is, is particularly powerful as being career changing uh, for me. Uh, it's been for, for, for the, uh, the, the students uh, and also for uh, Mas, she, is, she uh, has been advocating uh, students uh, participating on uh, in-class competitions and that's uh, when she teaches um, machine learning for biomedical applications uh, back in Cornell and uh, will be also teaching next year in the fall that uh, uh, it's been very, very helpful for, for a lot of students. So what what started for me 2015, uh, for uh, uh, Hussein in 2018, for Masa in 2017, then for the new student we had with this year with this competition. Okay, uh, so she, she started uh, her first competition, was very, uh, very excited about uh, starting a PhD uh, in uh, machine learning. Uh, while also being active uh, on, on this interesting, uh, it's a very good starter uh, problem for PhD students as well, I would say. Great. Well, thank you all so much. Um, and congratulations on behalf of Kaggle as well. Thank you.